From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Romulo Lulato will offer his evaluation of the Kansas wheat harvest and the mitigating factors that, in essence, created two crops in the state, he says. Outstanding wheat yields and test weights across a large part of western Kansas and spotty, often marginal production in the eastern two-thirds of the state. Then from Washburn University, Roger McGowan will talk about the important differences between Chapter 11 and Chapter 12 bankruptcy regulations that farmers should know about. He cites a recent situation where prior planning could have kept a dairy from ending up in an unfavorable bankruptcy status. Later on then, with another Stop, Look and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. Plus more here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to the midweek edition of Agriculture Today. We're glad to have you along once more. Well, this winter wheat harvest in Kansas has been fraught with irregularities, let's call it that. And we're going to get some observations now from K-State Research and Extension wheat production specialist Romulo Lolato about the good and the not so good concerning this 2019 wheat harvest. But depending on where you are in the state, the story on these wheat stands changes significantly, does it not, Romulo? Hi, Eric. Yes, it definitely does. Uh, depending on where we are in the state, we're seeing uh, quite a different yield levels and quite different uh, harvest reports coming out from producers, from our own small plot combines as well. Mm-hmm. Perhaps the, the main thing that we need to talk about as we're talking about wheat harvest is that we are approaching July 10th. And, and we're not done. <laughs> and we're not close to being done yet, right? That's the thing. So uh, looking at harvest reports from the USDA, right, and how they compare to the historical average, As of July 8th, so just this week, earlier this week, the USDA reported that we were about 61% done with harvesting Kansas. And that compared to close to 85% on a long-term average, right? And just a week ago, we were only 28%. And so that compares to about 61. So by the end of June, we're typically 60, 61% done with harvest. This year, we're, we're only 28%. That late harvest is mainly due to a few different things there. One, we planted half of the crop quite late this year, but the temperatures were pretty cold throughout the season. When we were in the early part of May, we were estimating two to three weeks behind in development, but we were thinking that the the crop was going to catch up because, well, May is going to turn out hot, right? So the crop will catch up. Well, that never happened, which is excellent for our grain yields overall, right? We had a cool and nice grain filling period up to now, up to late June, early July. While that was definitely beneficial for the grain yields of the crop that were still there and survived all the water, (laughs) it definitely pushed our harvest way behind as compared to average. There are places in the state where harvest is, in fact, wrapping up, while there are others that may have another, what, two or so weeks left to go? I believe so, Eric. So uh, if we look at south-central part of the state, uh, south-central Kansas there, Sumner County, perhaps as far west as the western edge of Rice County, more or less, uh, the wheat harvest is essentially reaching its end. Now, other parts of the state, like the northwest part of the state, is just now starting. Right. Uh, there were a few feuds around uh, that uh, Leodi Tribune region that uh, started being harvested. But uh, really, if you go north, Kobe or, or northwest from there, it's just now getting started. So uh, as we would expect, this difference, right, South Central uh, coming out first. And then we can already start seeing some of the things that we learned from that South Central region of the state. And what have we learned uh, in as far as yield performance, uh, the test weights, even protein levels? What's the general story in those harvested areas? 
it is really a hit or miss, right? This year, there's a lot of field-to-field variability, and that field-to-field variability has to do with a few different things, like the position of the field in the landscape, soil texture as well, and all of that comes back to the amount of water logging that we were having in the spring now, or really since the fall. If we think of parts of south-central Kansas that got up to 60 inches or more of rainfall since September 1st, uh, we should expect that uh, we would see some differences there more than anything based on uh, how well those fields are drained. And so talking to different producers, uh, more often than not, reports were coming like, uh, well, we're harvesting neighboring fields. One of them were, were yielding 60 bushels per acre with a 62, 63 test weight. This is typically a, a field that doesn't yield very well because more of a sandier soil. But remember that those sandier fields are going to be better drained. Mm-hmm. And then goes to a neighboring field, which typically yields more, but it's a more of a flat field, doesn't drain as well. Well, yields were going down to 20, 25 bushels per acre, test weight as low as 52, 53 on those fields that were waterlogged. So uh, the story of the Kansas wheat crop in the central corridor, and especially south central part of the state, is that this extreme variability in performance in yield and test weight, again, mostly very highly correlated to waterlogged conditions. The story improves, though, as one looks further to the West, and markedly so in some cases. Definitely this. Definitely this. As we go west, I mean, several of the reports in the southwest part of the of the state, Syracuse, Garden City, and going as far north as about Leody or Tribune there, uh, yields are actually coming out excellent, actually. We're, we heard reports that on average, fields were coming out 60, 70 bushels per acre, fields that typically yield 25 or 30 were coming out on, on 60 and 70 bushel per acre. Wow. And in many cases, really, where producers were a little bit more proactive in their management, perhaps on their nitrogen management and also on their fungicide, uh, hearing of reports of north of 100 bushels per acre in some of those fields. Excellent new conditions out in the western part of the state. So we really have these two different crops. The central Kansas, which is very it's variable in performance, depending on drainage of the field, and the western portion of the state where it has been more uniform, pretty high yields, pretty good test weights as well, reports coming in between 60 and up to 64, and protein on the low side. So typically 10, 10 10.5%, maybe up to 11 or 11.5%, but we are not really, I think I heard of one report of central Kansas that were close to 13%. The great majority of the other reports have been on the low side. And with that as well, we're seeing some protein premiums arise here and there. So uh, definitely, if you know that you managed your crop to a higher protein content, if you know that you had a little bit extra nitrogen out there, or if you can test your protein and you know that you have some protein, this is a year to try to capitalize on that. This is a year to try to go after some of those premiums because the majority of the Kansas crop is coming out on the low side. So you might want to store those high-protein wheats separately, market them accordingly as those premiums are being offered. But understanding that so much of what affected this year's winter wheat crop was out of the producer's hands with these extraordinarily high rainfall totals and continually waterlogged soils in parts of central Kansas in particular, what's been learned about management that considered here, do you think, Romulo? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, that's an excellent question, Eric, and it's not every year that we get to learn something about what you do under waterlogged conditions, right? And unfortunately, I don't think there there is much that producers can do. Let's talk about some of the consequences that we were seeing from these waterlogged conditions, mm-hmm. right? Uh, first, of course, uh, a very steep decrease in yield in these fields, and the, that decrease in yield is coming from, first, the effects of the waterlogging itself, on the plant, right, anaerobic conditions, uh, and, and if the plant was not respiring or it was through anaerobic conditions early on, that would that could kill the plant prematurely. But also, if the plant didn't die from that excessive water itself, uh, we were seeing quite a bit of lodging that was happening because of these uh, waterlogged conditions. Also, a very, very high weed pressure traveling through central Kansas, field after field full of weeds, pig weeds, uh, Mary's tail, and I mean, several different types of weeds that just came out after the wheat crop was ready because there's excessive moisture underneath it. The crop is not competing for lights or nutrients or resources anymore. And the delaying harvest due to these recent rainfalls as well. 
even fuels that were perhaps ready to harvest and, and, and with good potential, producers haven't been able to get into them yet. Unfortunately, we don't test the varieties under these circumstances too often. Perhaps a variety that this year, what would be related to a little bit better yields could have been maturity-wise. So perhaps a variety that was a little bit earlier and, and whenever it was waterlogged, it had more of the grain already formed. It may have benefited as compared to some of the later ones. So really uh, a really tough scenario. So this will be a talking point where those atypical conditions uh, were prevailing. As we look at variety evaluation here moving forward, you and your colleagues will be going through that process here quite shortly. So producers need to take things with a certain grain of salt as to how variety performance does shake out this year. Definitely, yes. Uh, uh, so we try to go to every single one of these variety performance tests before harvest a few times during the growing season. And if we identify that there's something wrong and that data should not be collected, we will we'll avoid publishing that data. And if you go to K-State website and you look into the variety performance that are reported, many times locations are not reported because it's better not to have that data than to have bad data. So we're, we're doing that evaluation in every one of these variety performance tests before we harvest. Uh, we're trying to do some of that filtering beforehand, but definitely any time that we look at variety performance data, we need to keep in mind that it's reflecting the conditions of this very past year in that location where it was conducted. And so there's a pretty high chance that variety performance tests this year will show excellent conditions in western Kansas and very, very variable conditions in central Kansas. Well, for those who still have wheat out in field, here's to several days of dry weather to help our producers get that crop in. And Romulo, we want to have you back here again very soon to talk about variety performance as the data does come in. Thanks for coming over, sharing these notes. Thank you, Eric. Those are observations on the Kansas winter wheat crop as harvest slugs along here in the state because of the uncooperative weather. Romulo Lulato is a wheat production specialist with K-State Research and Extension. We'll return in a moment with more on this Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Agriculture Today is back now. Well, as we know, times have become economically tough for more than a few agricultural producers out there this year for a a whole variety of reasons. As we visit once again with a professor of agricultural law and taxation out of Washburn University, Roger McCohen, we take up one angle on this that's important to understand if, in fact, the economics on a farm or ranch go far enough south that bankruptcy is the option uh, that's left to the producer. Roger, you put together a a write-up on the topic we'll take up today in a recent blog, and it looks at bankruptcy and the absolute priority rule. You'll explain what that is, but it's worthwhile to go back over what Chapter 12 is about and the latitude that that chapter provides to a producer in financial stress. Well, Chapter 12 was enacted in the 1980s during the the depth of that uh, farm debt crisis that was occurring at that time. What Chapter 12 allows is a farmer the ability to downsize their operation so that it can continue. It's a reorganization type of bankruptcy. It's not a liquidation bankruptcy. So the business is going to get reorganized. Now, the problem, the specific problem that Chapter 12 was designed to address was not only to allow farmers to continue farming, but also provide some relief from the problem associated with declining real estate values at that point in time. Because real estate, the farmland, served as the major item of collateral. So what Chapter 12 ultimately allows you to do is to reorganize your debts and cram down the debt to the value of the collateral and discharge the excess debt. 
And then we had an amendment in 2005 that put a tax provision in there that says that uh, for a, if, when you sell farm assets, because this was a problem that was encountered in the 80s and throughout the 90s, farmers were selling assets off to pay debt down, and then they couldn't pay the tax triggered by the asset sale. And that's a big issue if you have fully depreciated assets out and you don't have any income tax basis left, that, that uh, resulting gain is all taxable. So that was creating another problem. So Congress added a provision in 2005, and it says, well, if you do that and you do things properly, you're going to get to deprioritize those taxes and move those to the back of the line, so to speak, and treat the government as well as state tax departments as an unsecured claim not entitled to priority. And so with those two pieces together, the original legislation and the tax provision, Chapter 12 became very, very vital to those farming operations that found themselves in financial trouble, but still wanted to continue and had the prospect of being able to continue into the future. But at the crux of what we'll talk about today, the limitation on Chapter 12, uh, in as far as being eligible for this option, one's aggregate debt can only go up to a certain point, you say? Yeah, that's right. To be eligible to file Chapter 12, your debt cannot exceed $4,411,400. Now, that may seem like a big number, but what has happened over the past 10 years in particular, before the most recent downturn in the ag economy, things were pretty good for agriculture. So if we go back five, six, seven, eight years ago, during the good times, what a lot of farmers did was expand, and they bought machinery, they bought more land, they incurred more debt, which at that point in time looked fine because they could easily service that debt. Interest rates were low, conditions were favorable from an economic standpoint. But the problem is now with that aggregate debt limit at $4.4 million, we have a number of farmers that are in financial trouble but cannot qualify for a Chapter 12 because of that debt limit. And if they cannot qualify as such, they're left to only a couple of other options, liquidation under Chapter 7 or reorganization under Chapter 11. And Chapter 11 has its own perils, you say. Oh, a- absolutely. And Chapter 7 is much of an option. Of course, that's right. liquidation bankruptcy, so that means you're not going to continue. Now, in 11, is the general reorganization provision for individuals and firms that operate a business. There's no debt limit associated with an 11, but a major drawback of it is you've got a relatively short time to overcome your financial problems, and there's something called an absolute priority rule that prohibits debtors from retaining ownership of their property unless the unsecured creditors get 100% of their claims. That is going to be a very big problem for farmers that file a Chapter 11. So in further explaining the absolute priority rule, what it means is that it's much more difficult to put off creditors under these proceedings as it would be with Chapter 12. Right. There's really two prongs to the absolute priority rule. If a creditor objects to the reorganization plan that a farmer would put together, their objection is going to be upheld if the reorganization plan discriminates unfairly or is not fair and equitable with respect to each, what the code says, non-accepting class of claims or interest that is impaired by the plan. This fair and equitable notion, as we're going to see here in just a moment, that is a really big problem When you're trying to reorganize your debts and trying to deprioritize taxes, it's going to be very easy for a court to say, well, what you want to do is not fair and equitable, and you are going to be stopped by that absolute priority rule. And that's why we don't want a farmer to end up in 11. Uh, It's just not going to work. You want to be able to qualify under 12. By way of example, you have this recent bankruptcy case that you cite in your write-up on this. It was a dairy and that absolute priority rule came into play within this. So what was the background on the dairies situation? Well, this was a dairy that was structured as a limited liability partnership and taxed as a partnership, which means there's no tax that the entity pays. It all flows through to the individual members of that partnership. They filed Chapter 11 in late 2016. They were over the aggregate debt limit at that point in time. It was about $4.1 million then. And so they couldn't file a 12, so they file an 11. That's going to create a problem here. They get their plan confirmed by the bankruptcy court in mid-2018. Then the debtor cannot make their plan payments, and the Committee of Unsecured Creditors motioned for an appointment of a liquidating trustee. So they're moving to liquidate this. 
And the debtor objects on the basis that, well, when I have to sell the assets, when I liquidate, that's going to trigger capital gain taxes. And the combination of those taxes and the trustees' fees and the attorney's fees and the committee for the creditors, their fees, the, their attorney fees, that's going to completely consume the sale proceeds of, of my encumbered real estate, my farm equipment, my cattle, and it's going to render my bankruptcy estate completely insolvent. And it's going to leave me personally subject to paying the unpaid income taxes. And so as a result of that, the debtor said, well, now I've had a few months to deal with some creditors. I have come up with some funds to pay some debt down. Now I'm eligible for a 12. I want to convert my 11 case to a 12 because that's going to allow me to get the advantages of a 12, which includes deprioritizing those taxes. So I'm not going to have to pay those taxes in full up front. Uh, I'm going to get a lot of them discharged. They're going to be forgiven, and uh, they're going to be treated as an unsecured claim. Well, as you can imagine, the Committee of Unsecured Creditors said, whoa, 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 this this is not fair. Plus, the non-priority treatment of capital gain taxes, that's not an issue at all because the debtor is an entity. It's a pass-through entity, and it, it has no liability for any taxes. So they said, what are you talking about? This isn't going to work. And so the, the debtor in response said, well, I can file a form, uh, it's an 8832 with the IRS, I can check a box to change my tax treatment by election so that I can be treated as a C corporation. And that then the capital gain taxes on sale of all these farm assets can be discharged as an unsecured claim. Well, the, the Unsecured Creditors Committee argued, well, we don't think you can make that election because you weren't eligible to file a 12 at the time you filed the 11. And then that absolute priority rule, since you are in 11, is unfair in terms of its treatment with respect to us if you were able to switch those taxes to a 12 and get them discharged. That's not fair. That's not equitable. And the court said, that's exactly correct. We cannot approve a plan that gives a holder of a claim anything unless the objecting classes have been paid in full. You filed an 11, you're subject to that rule, you can't convert. So, Roger, could that farm operation have averted this situation with better planning in as far as the structure of the operation and obviously as they approach these difficulties, uh, filing at the right time with the right procedure here? Yeah, that's a great question. And this this is really the teaching point, I think, out of this case, that the dairy should have filed that election to be treated as a C corporation at least one year before they filed the bankruptcy petition. Then they would have a still before they file a pre-petition partial liquidation of the assets that aren't necessarily absolutely essential to continuing the operation. Sell those off, use those funds, pay your debt down, get it underneath the Chapter 12 limit, then file a Chapter 12. If you are having financial trouble and it looks like bankruptcy may be in your future, you better start talking to your professional sooner rather than later because they can catch this and advise you properly as to how to structure your organization, when to time your asset sales, and when to file bankruptcy. Well, producers, you can have a look at the full account of this situation that Rogers put on his blog at washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. It looks at farmers, bankruptcy, and the absolute priority rule. That's the title of this particular article. An important message for producers who may be facing these difficulties. And Roger, always appreciate your time and your input. Many thanks. Thank you, Rick. He is Roger McGowan. A professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law. We feature him every other week right here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back and thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. 
In today's agricultural news, U.S. agricultural exports are running below those of a year ago, but are they running just about where USDA had projected? Gary Crawford takes a closer look. The Department of Agriculture has been forecasting that U.S. ag exports this fiscal year will hit $137 billion. Where are we as of the end of May? $92.4 billion. And so, Agriculture Department trade economist Cameron Doherty says you can do the math. In order to get to 137, we've got to sell over $44.5 billion worth during the four-month June through September period. And that would be an average sales per month of just over $11 billion. And we have topped that mark most months of this year. But August and September do tend to be lower sales months as U.S. crops are just beginning to be harvested. So, will we get to that $137 billion sales forecast. Doherty told us... I would not be surprised if estimates were uh, pushed down. I, I think we have a lot of downward pressure as of now. But he says anything could happen, and so... We'll have to cross our fingers and see. And we will see on August 29th, that's when USDA issues its next ag trade forecast. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. Well, there are some similarities between corn and soybean crop development. Stephanie Ho has more with USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey. In some ways, the situation for soybeans is similar to corn. That is late development and not very good conditions compared to last year. 96% of the U.S. soybean crop has been planted by July 7th. That compares to the five-year average of 99% and last year's 100%. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says only 90% of soybeans have emerged compared to a five-year average of 98%. Our first peak at soybeans blooming, this for the week ending July 7th, just one-tenth of the U.S. soybeans blooming by the 7th of July, five-year average 32 percent, last year 44 percent. Unlike corn, though, soybean condition is down slightly. We're seeing the crop 53 percent, good to excellent, down a point from a week ago, 12 percent very poor to poor, that is up a point from last week and far below last year's rating, 71 percent good to excellent, 7 percent very poor to poor. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture culture in Washington, D.C. USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service is offering a special Environmental Quality Incentives Program sign-up for farmers in governor-declared counties in Kansas who could not plant their crops because of flooded or wet fields. As of the end of June, 63 Kansas counties had been declared disaster areas due to either flooding or tornadoes. This added NRCS sign-up provides technical and financial assistance to help farmers plant cover crops, an alternative to letting fields go fallow and uncovered. The deadline to apply is July 26th. Excessive moisture and flooding in 2019 have prevented or delayed planting on many farms across the country. Many producers are unable to plant crops by a final planting date or have experienced significant delays in planting. Fields that are saturated for an extended period can lose important soil organisms, cover crop roots, add organic matter, and create pathways for air and water to move through the soil, which is key to restoring its health. For more information on disaster assistance programs, contact your local USDA service center or visit farmers.gov slash prevented planting. Well, although legalized by the 2018 Farm Bill, the Agriculture Secretary says that industrial hemp growers still face challenges regarding the growth and expansion of this industry. Rod Bain reports. What I heard is a lot of optimism regarding the opportunities. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue recently speaking in the Bluegrass State about how industrial hemp, legalized per the 2018 Farm Bill, could provide economic benefits for growers in states like Kentucky and across the country via products ranging from biofuels and CBD oils, animal feedstuffs, and textiles. Yet the Secretary in this visit to Kentucky joined many stakeholders in this fairly new, quickly growing industry in pointing out there are challenges going forward. And it's not just the challenge created by misconceptions consumers may have between industrial hemp and its cousin, illegal in some states, cannabis. Secretary Purdue says these misconceptions are also a main factor behind both regulatory and financial challenges in expanding the industrial hemp industry. For instance, a lack of uniform nationwide regulations in part created via states that legalize both cannabis and industrial hemp pre-2018 Farm Bill. A standardization of regulations across the country over states being somewhat equal in the level playing field between that. There are also various transportation and financial transaction challenges as well. 
We heard about the transportation of extract that is prohibited currently. We heard about financial transaction issues where this new crop is kind of conflated with cannabis and the financial industry has to accept that this is a legal crop. Industrial hemp producers also told the secretary they need modern farming techniques created via research to develop a safe, healthy, and quality crop, as well as the development of actuarially sound crop insurance programs for growers. We don't know what the production capacity of these crops are because they're new, and we'll work through that. What we'll have for 2020 is called a whole revenue farm policy, and that's typically done on specialty crops or crops where you can't insure a crop itself but have a whole farm revenue policy there. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. The industry-driven pilot project testing a disease traceability system in Kansas is beginning to generate results. Todd Domer takes a look at some of the early data. The Cattle Trace pilot project for disease traceability has been collecting data for nine months. Project managers recently shared read rates for electronic readers installed at participating auction markets and feed yards. Cattle enrolled in the program by ranchers are fitted with high-frequency electronic identification tags. According to the real-time data, which is collected at the speed of normal commerce, the average read rate at livestock markets is 94 percent, with the average for feed yards at 98 percent. A few cattle recently began moving to packers, with recent read rates in the 90 percent range. During the two-year pilot project, Cattle Trace will collect the minimal data necessary for disease traceability, including the date and time, an individual animal identification number, and a location each time an animal's tag is read with pilot project readers in the production chain. About 55,000 Kansas-based calves will be tagged for the pilot, which will conclude in 2020. Cattle Trace is approaching the goal of distributing the 55,000 tags in Kansas and is seeking additional partners at the backgrounder and cow-calf levels. Organizers are targeting producers who do business with existing program partners in the auction market and feed yard sectors. For more information, go to cattletrace.org. I'm Todd Domer. And that's a look at today's agricultural news. Agriculture Today continues after the break. This is the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. If we remember people by the photos we have, I think poems or words they wrote are another way to stay close. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. Don. I remember him well, very well. Don Mock was a great friend. He was the extension specialist in veterinary entomology. He died April 2013. I miss him and his sense of humor. I remember one day watching him as I passed rummaging in the open trunk of his car. When he saw me, he called out to me, and when I stepped closer, he handed me a copy of his first published poetry booklet, Places and People, a book of poems by Don Mock. Then he scribbled something in the front, which I won't quote, but I treasure it. Don Mock was a great guy. If we remember people by the photos we have, I think poems or words they wrote are another way to stay close. Don wrote some good ones. I'm going to read you one which especially older farmers should feel close to. I do 
as I cultivated acres and acres of gladiola fields many years ago. The poem is called Why Farmers Have Crooked Necks in the Early Days of Summer. Note, several of these lines were composed while he, Don, was cultivating corn on a John Deere B after he had spent several days at it. Now the poem. Twas the last day of June at the county fair, and all the town folk and farmers were there. Look there, Dad, the town boy said. Who's that man with his neck so red? One shoulder low, the other one high, and a twitching nerve near his crimson eye. How come he's weathered and twisted so? Was he hurt in a battle long ago? Answered he, the father, I declare, you've a sixty-four dollar question there. I'll figure this red-necked feller out. He sure is crooked. There is no doubt. I'm a lawyer who's paid to think. First, I'll figure why his neck so pink. Then, why his shoulders are out of line and ride on down his tortured spine. By gauging him systematically, I'll peg this feller, yes siree. So long he pondered and much he thought, and fretted and sweated, but he progressed not. His son next words then deepened his frown. Look, Dad, they're all around. Those red-necked men, I mean. See the one by that big machine? And another one over there by the cattle yard. And three together, laughing hard. Well, now, if that doesn't beat a deuce, there must be a whole new species loose. So the good town lawyer shook his head. Tis a question that'll haunt me till I fall down dead. I'd ask those fellas how they got that way, but it's well known that prying won't pay. At last, toward evening, home they went, the boy and the man, both discontent. Without his supper, the boy retired, but his father ate and became inspired. I know, he said, who'll help me out? There's a man who'll know beyond a doubt. A retired farmer, old man there. It's not like asking the ones at the fair. So he donned his head and quickly strode across the yard and up the road. At Thayer's gate, a big voice boomed. Come in, it said, and the figure loomed of a strong old man, still straight but slow. Now tell me why you're rushing so. You're all head up like a mallet drake. Ma, fetch this man some milk and cake. Here on the porch, just have a seat. And he led the way on bare old feet. Then sat a lawyer on a chair. It was easy to feel welcome there. And all of a sudden he blurted out, all that he'd come to ask about. And the old man nodded and sent a wink to his blessed wife as he stalled to think. And at last he rose and shook his head and chuckled a little as he said, ha, I'm, I'm sorry they gave you such a fright, but I can promise you they'll be all right. There's no use in telling you how and why. To understand it, you have to try. To sit on a tractor all day long and watch the rows as they slip along and guide the wheels by watching the path of the cutting knives as they cut a swath of weeds quite close to the planted row. If you understood me, you'd already know. So, I'll only say, it's cultivating time. To all crook-necked farmers, I give this rhyme. 
I didn't ask Don's permission, but I'm sure he doesn't mind. Poems are to be read, and old friends are to be remembered. In the early 60s, I used to cultivate 80 acres of colorful gladioli. I know what it was like to have the crooked neck. A moment of less attention could swipe out a few feet of gladiola corms. The tractor, an international, no AC, only hot wind to cool you. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. That caps off our Wednesday edition. Thanks for being along with us. We'll be right back here this same time tomorrow. Hope you will be likewise. Meantime, and for Jeff Wickman, Eric Atkinson here, this has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.